Hello, welcome everyone to the analytical figure drawing class um, that's offered through the CGMW. Uh, my name is Michael Hampton and I will be the instructor for this class um, and we'll be together for the next eight weeks uh, going over the figure um, like the course title uh, and it'll be an analytical survey of the figure taking into account process, uh, the larger masses and perspectives um, all the while trying to take the actual and make it more didactic and practical. Um, so very uh, hopefully clear process that will be gauged or based on giving you an approach to the figure that can be invention um, heavy and or a great first pass through understanding the surface forms. Um, this is the website that I keep uh, it's a kind of a supplement to the book that I've written on figure drawing process. It's called Figure Drawing Design and Invention. And it's really the um, primary way that I'm engaging in this industry. Uh, so I'm a little bit different from some of your other instructors. I'm not uh, working in an industry studio. I'm much uh, more interested in education. So I'll be doing, or I do quite a bit more um, teaching, lecturing, um, stuff like that. So my engagement with this industry is primarily through um, education. And as such, I have this website set up to facilitate learning um, and help with what I have written and put into the book. Um, I also hope it'll be useful for you um, as students in this course. It has in each one of these links just um, a number of examples, different drawings that will go with certain chapters in the book and as I don't think that you'll have to buy the a book uh, because you'll have the, the lectures, uh, hopefully these will just be supplemental. I also have a blog here that I do try to keep um, a lot of links on for homework and or resources and then I just try to dump drawings here all the time. Um, and the reason for that is I think it's a really great and interesting way to make sure that the book is kind of a very organic, continually evolving thing so that the chapters that are written and printed um, can continue to evolve in the sense by people being able to uh, come back and check this and see new examples or images and hopefully understand the material all the better for it. Uh, so that's my main kind of interest and concern. Uh, so this is the website. Um, I've also developed one that's just specific for your, this class. So uh, for the analytical figure drawing class, I wanted something to be more personal, um, to be a little bit more private, uh, because you have paid for a class. I want to make sure that you get everything possible from it um, that you've kind of anticipated going in. So in this blog, it will be kind of more invitation only. It will only be um, you as students or your fellow students in this course. Um, and as such, I hope that you treat it as a community or as a place where you can post your work um, or critique each other or comment on one another's work. Um, just a place to build a community. Um, another place, I know that the CGMW uh, websites will also offer that as an opportunity. This is just one more. I want to make sure that um, I can make my lecture material and teaching as transparent as possible and that you feel like you have um, every possible avenue or opportunity to kind of get in touch with me or have some type of um, interaction. So what you'll find here is that there's also links and I'll grow this list as we move on. The links are um, now there for homework and reference. So Pose Maniacs and Character Designs are two good websites that have a lot of uh, reference imagery for figures. Um, what I've also put up as I'm doing this kind of intro after the fact is some of the week one lecture materials. Um, you all have the video, but I'm also going to try every week to post still imagery of the works or drawings in progress so that you can see and have an opportunity to kind of be a little bit more meditative on some of the imagery after you've watched the videos, if you need it. So um, maybe printing these out and having them with you when you do homework or just referencing the drawings as you do your homework may be more convenient 
uh, than having to turn the video on again or watch the video again. So I'll do this every week and at the bottom the only other post so far is just a welcome which is essentially all of the same things that I'm saying to you now. So again, please feel free to use this as a place to interact, um, have discussion, ask questions, you know, most importantly. Uh, if you feel that I'm not giving you the resources that you need or that I could be doing something different or better, please feel free to let me know. I'm here to make sure that you um, really do see some improvements and changes in your figure drawings that I hope will be um, well worth the time that you spent here. Um, to that point, what I also will put up that I only have now here as a document is your course outline. Right, so I'm going to put this somewhere up on the blog so that you can always reference it and come back to it. If you do have the book, Design and Invention, it following the chapters, pretty much chapter for chapter, um, except because this is an analytical figure drawing sense and it's more of a general class in its overview, we'll really be doing only the larger forms. So um, it's process intensive and uh, form intensive in its analytic uh, survey. So it's not going to be going into hands and feet, uh, but only major masses. Um, and uh, what I've planned is week one, gesture. Week two is connections. Week three, head drawing. Four and five are the torso. Uh, those lectures are a little bit more intensive and the skill level kind of jumps up a little bit at that point uh, or the technical requirements for kind of doing the the homework or understanding the material so I space it out six is the legs and then seven and eight kind of broken into those two for the arm um, that being said I'm more than happy to look at your hand and foot drawings if you would like some feedback at any point um, but it is for time considerations and energy considerations of students and teacher uh, too much in an eight week quarter or period of time to cram all that stuff together. There's not enough time for, for me in the lecture development. Um, and this is a course that I usually teach at private schools or colleges in anywhere from 11 weeks to 14 weeks. So to condense any of this information then down into eight is already a lot of information. So um, you can see that also every week I've put up homework that I would recommend that you do. Um, of course you don't have to and if you don't that's fine. I'm not going to fail you. You can't get kicked out so you shouldn't worry about it. Uh, but it will allow you to see a lot more improvement much more quickly. And this is all here for you to read. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, what I'm asking you to do is for every assignment to choose five, three, four of your best every week and submit to me for the video feedback right? so I can give you some interaction on the drawing and correction. Um, it could be your five best or it could be your five worst. It might be more productive if it's your worst because that way I can really help you on the stuff that you think you're having the greatest problem with or difficulty with. Um, so homework is 25 construction, 25 head drawing. The only week that has a larger sum or amount of homework is the first one because it's just repetition. Um, and if you think about gesture drawings, each one is done in a minute. That homework assignment is like upwards of a couple hours maybe or less than that. So um, really not that big of an assignment and it's just that it sounds like a lot. So that's it. That's the overview of the course and some of the resources that I've set up to kind of help you in the kind of progression through it. Um, this is going to be the gesture week, as you can kind of see from some of the lectures uh, that I've posted up online. Um, so again, thank you for joining me uh, in this course. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited to kind of interact with all of you in this uh, kind of interesting and new forum. So without a Further ado, let's um, go ahead and get into the materials. Uh, very last thing is, you know, please feel free to contact me at any time through email. Um, I'm absolutely happy to uh, talk with all of you, and I'm very much looking forward to it. I try to position my teachings in a way that is between um, the knowledge-driven or the anatom anatomical and the 
practical. Right? So to me, the practical is maybe even a little bit more important uh, because there are all these incredibly difficult existing concepts about um, anatomy, but maybe in a sense it's even more difficult to understand how to integrate them and use them. So this is going to be our um, model figure or diagram, just so we can you know, flesh out some ideas and then the goal will be that later in the course these kind of come to life with a little bit more um, design and, and development. Uh, for the books, reference books, uh, what I would recommend, even though I'll be showing you know, a, a good amount of pictures, is that you uh, do have a book. Uh, I would never require that any of you buy the one that I wrote, um, although it would be good, it would go w with the course well. Uh, but that being said, if you do take stellar notes during the class, um, you shouldn't need it. Another consideration would be to get an anatomy book. Uh, this is something that you're definitely going to need. Uh, and one of the ones that I prefer is the Elliot Goldfinger Human Anatomy for the Artist. Um, it's just something that I have enjoyed. Uh, I think it's a good book. It's uh, pretty comprehensive in that it goes through... Um, muscle, shape, photographic view, kind of diagrammatic, illustrative view. Uh, it seems to cover all of the uh, qualities and views, um, even though the text is a little dry. Um, and as we get closer or nearer to that date, um, I'm going to recommend a few more. Okay, So um, I'll even make it a list or a book list available um, on your class blog, which again, you should all be getting um, an email from me in the first week. Okay, so I feel a little guilty spending too much time talking about setting stuff up and not getting to the uh, subject matter at hand. And let's start that. So I can do a lot of these kind of house cleaning duties in um, how I present the blog and that's really actually the main reason for it, is to allow us as much time here to talk. Um, so again, today will be gesture. Uh, it's our theme and really important concept for today. Um, and it is a concept. Right? Let's make sure that we keep that in mind. Uh, drawing the figure, especially in the context of this class, uh, does deal pretty heavily with abstraction, which may sound weird and slightly disturbing. Um, but I think that this is kind of the bread and butter of most arts, which just means to withdraw, to um, reduce from an object, a specific object, some type of essence, uh, doesn't, not in any way meant there to be a spiritual essence, um, but something that is thematic to it as a, as a form or as a subject or as an idea. Um, so that's a lot of what gesture is. It's going to be very different from what we'll put on this side, which is the contour. So if this is something that you're familiar with, it's not bad. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not um, not value-based as far as a judgment of right or wrong, but it's different. It's different than how I'll be teaching or I'll be going through the work and study of the figure. This is something that's more directly built and made for observation. Um, what we're going to be doing is looking more at invention. Uh, I want you to understand the figure and the figure mechanics so that you'll have the ability to invent. The differences here that I see uh, would be that this is something that ultimately would allow for uh, a much easier transition into character concept design, something that requires more of a mechanical understanding of uh, the structure. Um, differences in their process. This is something that's almost exclusively working from the outside to the inside. Uh, we start with the outside of the contour lines and then we after encapsulating a figure in a single line, start to shade inside. Um, the invention is something that's more inside out. So uh, when we study or you do your homework this week, um, the assignment is all laid out with a number on the uh, course outline that again will be available to you. Uh, and that will be really about trying to get in these lines to the insides of the form. So if you find that your lines are kind of starting to meander and wander towards that outside point again, make sure you really do force the idea of bringing them back in. Okay, so we have a couple things here. 
Uh, one, we're just defining what it is that we're drawing by what we know not to do. And we're setting up a new concept for the development of the figure based on abstraction. So first of all, we have to determine what it is about the figure that can be easily abstracted into a type of essence. Okay, so uh, a type of edited concept of its essentials. Uh, and the way I do that is just by uh, looking at a few of the things that are very specific to the figure. Um, and in gesture, what I want to do is create a list so that I know what to, is the most important things um, for the figure. And I think that will lead us here, at least um, intellectually, a lot more easily. Um, the first thing that's really important in gesture is the concept of a story. Um, and not like you have to have a great kind of opus or you know, completed narrative in any sense, but um, story I'll take to mean here as what's interesting about it. So if anything, uh, I'm kind of of the opinion that if we don't have an interesting position or something interesting to say with the figure, uh, that it may be better just to not draw it. Um, but it could be anything. It doesn't have to be grand. Although your industry does seem to like exaggeration. Um, and maybe that's because it makes the mood, posture, position, or expression of the figure much larger and easily recognizable. So exaggeration of any quality. Um, you could just fill in the blank here with a uh, descriptive term. Angry, excited. Uh, it could also be something more subtle. Uh, there's something to be said for the subtle positionings of the figure um, to study the kind of the beauty that exists in the counter positioning of weight between pelvis and shoulder line, uh, the way that we hold our bodies in a very specific way to each individual. This may also be how you recognize your best friend or family member from 30 to 40 feet away when you really strip down all those details and get at uh, what, what is at the core of how we identify with one another on a very large scale or global level. Uh, this is what a story would be. Or anything else. I mean, as long as it's something that you start with that is concept-based and based on an importance for organizing the rest. Detail may not at this stage be a, a great way to start with gesture because it addresses the specific too soon. The next thing is, after having establishing this, which is our, our theme, that's another way to think more in terms of story, um, a theme to the figure, two and the rest that I write below um, are more about explaining it, but explaining it in a way that's uh, believable. So the second thing is the observance of weight and balance in the figure. This is incredibly important that as figures we are machines that are in a constant state of compromise between weight and balance um, and we'll look at a couple of examples for that um, just for example to, to begin think of what it is to walk or to run um, it's a very chaotic play of weight and balance uh, we have to throw ourselves out of balance to take a step and then we catch it again and then we have to throw ourselves out of balance again and then we catch it again. So even the very basic idea of movement is a chaotic balancing act. Um, and what we want to put this in opposition to is um, contour. Because right? what we'd like to do, or what I'd like to have you think about, is if you are uh, still thinking in terms of drawing contour at this stage, uh, that you maybe look at this with some new critical sensibilities and I really do ask if this is maybe the best way to realize the figure and I think that um, I can use this example because it's how I learned to draw so I'm not trying to be judgmental or critical I'm just purely speaking here from experience uh, but when I really started to think about what it is I was doing and, and how it affected the viewer and the drawing, uh, I think that we'll find that none of the things that we consider truly realistic in the sense of uh, the analytical conditions of the figure apply here. Um, for example, weight and balance. Uh, this guy is 
entirely stacked. Right? Everything is perfectly symmetrical. And this is uh, it's like a giant turd figure. Everything here is perfectly balanced, which we are just not. But the tendency in the contour is that we do make these symmetrical line choices. But what we really have in the figure, and we'll do uh, a profile view here, is more so that very, very dramatic system and play of balance. And so as we start to work, oops, sorry about that, as we start to work here through this explanation, what we're now looking at is the eight parts of the figure. So just to make sure you can follow my train of thought, um, as this is all the important stuff for getting the drawing up and off the ground, uh, we'll add a few more qualifying descriptive terms. So what we've started with again for a brief review is the idea that gesture is important and in our journey to abstract something to use in gesture, uh, again, some type of essence. We've looked at things that are very much specific to the figure, and now we're starting to look at the eight parts. Because these are the things that we will be describing um, in gesture. Right? These are the most important elements that we do have to make sure that we get across and communicate with. So this is our, if we made this even more specific, this will be our why. Why are we drawing the figure? This will be our what? What is it exactly that we're drawing? And what we're still working towards is our how, which is this. How are we going to draw the figure? So these are the, again, this is thematically how I'm going to run this course. Um, again, we have to know what it is we're looking at even if it's anatomy, but most importantly, we have to know how to draw it. Um, so I hope that the course can make some type of light bulb go off in between for you. Um, at the very least, maybe you get an idea of how to organize difficult subject matter into a palatable artistic process. Okay, sorry for that digression. We're back now at the eight parts of the figure where we've been talking about weight and balance. Uh, most important for weight and balance, and what we do really notice in the figure, is the idea that the profile view demonstrates that the figure is a natural balancing act. Uh, if we start to look here, what we'll notice is that the head, uh, as a form, is pushed out over the rib cage by the neck. So we have this uh, tilt. The neck is positioned in a way which throws that head out over and across the rib cage. Uh, because of that, so let's say we break that into a simple idea of a tilt, a form that's in tilt. Uh, what we'll notice next is that the rib cage leans back. And what this allows for is the accommodation of the volumes and their tilt above the neck and the head. Uh, as we move down and into the pelvis, this has a another counter position as the pelvis works in a different two-dimensional tilt than the ribcage above, neck, and head. Uh, so that also brings us to our first three of the eight parts. We have a head, ribcage, pelvis, um, two legs, Aren't you glad you took the class? You've learned that you have all of these parts and two arms, which we've left out here. Most important and key to what we're talking about here is the spine. That is really why we're seeing this kind of dramatic counter positioning in our major parts here, our major symmetrical areas of the body. Uh, this really nice, beautiful S-curve. Uh, the reason that the head is projected forward is because of the cervical section. So you have the cervical section first, of which there's seven, ending at the seventh cervical vertebrae. And we're going to leave the spine in very general terms for now. We have this change in direction at the thoracic, which is pushing the ribcage forward. So that's going to 
start to look something more like this. And in the thoracic, we have 12 vertebrae. And then at the very bottom, this last line that led into the pelvis would be the inclusion of the spine, and that would be your lumbar, of which there's five. Really important form for understanding gesture. Um, I'm going to work always from the head through the spine to the weight bearing leg when we begin our process portion of today's lecture. Uh, so make sure that you, from any of you, really do your best to try to come to some kind of agreement with what's going on with the spine. It'll make a huge difference. Um, and also you can see that what's happening is that when we really start to look at what's going on in order to abstract something that's realistic or natural, uh, we're finding that it looks less and less like what maybe we were, or me, what I was more inclined to do. So this idea of a gesture uh, is really going to allow us for a new level of realism. Okay. We've set up our tilts. We've given one example of how weight and balance work. Um, that's not the only one. If we look at the legs, in your legs you'll see that uh, the femur has somewhat of a bow that makes it a C-curve, and that the tibia and fibula give a counter-curve. So in our legs, we have an S. So we're a kind of chaotic system of tilt that's balanced on a very you know, spring-like femur and tibia and fibula. Um, great design. Now we can absorb weight, uh, we can run, we can move. A right? very dynamic design here. That's from the side. Uh, from the front, we can show another example of weight and balance. Uh, the balance here is one of hard and soft. So this is a hard form. Primarily bone. Primarily bone. Giant mass of the rib cage. We have all of our ribs. True, false, and floating into the pelvis, bony landmark, which we'll talk about in the second week, uh, and not to get too far into that, but they're all balanced between areas of muscle or fat. So in between the transitional areas, we'll have soft forms. Uh, and this is one way that you can always break down the transitional forms. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on um, with pinches or stretches. But just another concept or realization here of the figure as a balancing act. Um, design in this sense. Yeah. Something that you could definitely even show in line weight, hard versus soft, which we'll talk about as meaning um, sharp versus uh, flesh or bone versus flesh. So that's my description of that second really important concept of weight and balance. Uh, third one will be movement. And this isn't just posing the figure in a position that has movement. It's suggesting to the viewer in the way that the figure is drawn that there is a level of movement that should be involving them as they see the drawing. So now we're getting closer to this. Uh, what we've determined is that this needs to be engaging, number one, whatever the engagement is. Uh, number two, we have to have something that communicates a display and difference of weight and visual balance that also, number three, shows and showcases a sense of movement. Um, and what we're going to use to do that is gesture and the gesture curves, um, which are going to be asymmetrical lines. This is one of the best ways and historically consistent ways for showing the figure in an edited way that communicates uh, most everything that's important to it. It's also a way that has commonly been used in the popular arts to engage uh, an audience or to draw or design something with mass appeal. Um, so the asymmetrical lines uh, will begin inside, but you can see that when we do use them, and as we start to look more at our how here, the asymmetrical lines, I'll get rid of some of this, are going to be very much a repetition of the spine. So 
So here's our asymmetrical lines. The type of lines that I'm going to be using in this class will be straight C and S curves. That's it. That's all I ever use. So there's going to be no crazy, uh, over elaborate way of using line. I'm always going to be very, hopefully not too repetitively so, um, but clear as far as why I use the lines and when, so that you can take this structure or format and then start to play, change, do whatever it is you choose to do with it. Um, but the way that we've talked about organizing these lines for now is an asymmetrical uh, rhythmic placement, which is the antithesis of this. Contour, I wanted to make everything symmetrical. And as we address number three still, which is movement, because of principles of closure, where our eye likes to complete forms, this does not give me a great deal of movement, as we have a tendency, again, to shut these off. So my movement through is very abrupt. Instead, what we're going to be doing is trying to organize lines with their apex counter to one another. And this is just a diagram. When I do make these lines, ultimately, they can have any length. And it might be preferable to think about their um, asymmetry and length, or line weight, and anywhere else you can push these concepts. The basic idea here is that if we always position a curve, or the axes, the high point to that curve offset to the apex of the curve after, that it does coax our eye into wanting to travel through. So now on number three, what we've done is we've built uh, a visual system of movement that is still consistent with all the other ideas. Uh, the other ways that I'll be using these lines will be to repeat them and to wrap them. And we'll leave, leave that for a little bit later. Um, the consistency that I'm seeing to the asymmetrical lines in the figure when we get to the end or the finish is that it's also the anatomy. Right? If we do look at um, an anatomical part, like say uh, the arm, what you'll find is that the musculature of all of our asymmetrical parts, like arms or legs, does use this, or does look like this. So in this roundabout way, as we've really tried to slow down and reconceive of what the figure is, um, I think what we're going to end up doing is arriving at a more um, consistent and expanded sense of what is realistic um, in depicting the figure. So uh, this would be my very simple drawing of an arm, my cartoon arm at this point. And what we see in the arm is that the outside contour lines are asymmetrical. And this is how we work. Here we have the deltoid counter in position to the tricep, which is flexed to straighten the arm. That is counter in position to the apex of the bicep, which is stretched to allow for the arm to straighten all the way down right, through the flexors, extensors. So that is what we look like. Um, even though this is now an inside conception of how to organize the figure because of some of the concepts that we've already explored, it really is what our contours look like. Nothing like that. I, I would draw the arm to start like this, which, even though it's what I thought I saw, has nothing to do with what the figure actually looks like. Um, so that will be the reason, the how, and our ultimate kind of abstraction of what is essential to the specific object. The last thing that I'm going to talk about as the fourth and final um, concept here of importance is proportion. And I finish it, or discuss it last, because I think at this stage it's the least important. Um, I think that there is a lot of uh, great systems of measurement, and every book will give you a different one. But to me, this is and has to be the most important, even if it means at the expense of proportion for a while. I would rather you really try to push and exaggerate your drawings for story and not worry about if the proportion is looking correct. Um, sometimes I think that if you do spend too much time thinking through proportion, that what it's going to do is just stiffen your drawings. Uh, and because there's so much that's relative there, uh, what is average, what is 
ideal? What is heroic? What is for fashion? What is for marvel? What is for mannerist? Uh, the proportion is constantly changing. Uh, so it's best if we can organize everything under story, and then if you are making a mannered figure or a heroic figure, then you can change after the gesture is laid out, or you can build on the gesture to show that, that play and that difference. Okay, and this is it. If there were to be, when I'm drawing, some type of, so that's me, uh, word bubble that would come up over my head that would show what I was thinking about uh, as I'm frustrated drawing, uh, this is what it would be looking like. So what this part of the lecture is meant to do is to give you the lay of the land to let you know um, what it is that I'm thinking about so that you can have access to um, the thoughts and organization. In that sense, you can change it. You can personalize it. You can do whatever you want with it. But I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable if you know where I'm coming from and why. Um, what we'll do for the next part is demonstrate this with process. Uh, I think it's important that I do spend time just here. So we'll look at some drawings and um, I'll put this into a, I think, a palatable system so that you can use it. And then after that, we'll briefly look at some historical examples so you can um, get a kind of a premature or just a very um, surface relationship to how it's been used. Because I didn't invent this. It doesn't exist in isolation as really nothing in art or the arts do. So I hope that this has been informative uh, as our jumping off point. Again, it is a stage that's meant to be supported by every other stage. So it is the, the blueprint for the rest of the construction to be done. We already went through the gesture portion uh, in explanation and theory only. So what we're going to do now is spend some time trying to uh, put it into practice so that you'll have a pretty good idea about how to go about um, doing your homework and or thinking through a drawing in this way. So I just have a number, um, just four different drawings that we'll look at. I think it's good to mix up um, your study between the observation of old masters, so like Michelangelo here, we have an example of a drawing by him, and then uh, photographs or people you see so that you're always pulling from different sources, um, studying artists who have made um, solutions to design issues relative to the figure, and you take that and look at photos and take uh, a natural study of, of the form from that so that you can always be kind of challenging yourself to develop a new or personal um, system of drawing. So uh, in gesture, we define this with four different terms. We said that the most important things to find were story, um, weight balance, movement, and then proportion. So those are the things that we want to think about. Um, we challenged ourselves to think in a new way with abstraction to define an essence and that led us to the idea of the asymmetrical lines and we made many observations as to how that is consistent with the eight parts uh, whoops. okay so these are things I want to think about that's the remember that's the why the how is the repeating curves okay um, so in doing this what I'd like to give you is just one way to think through it. And I don't want it to be overbearing or um, too rigorous, because you can always change it. The suggestion now is that you have something so that you can um, follow a program, just, just until you um, get comfortable with it. And then you can, like I've said previously a number of times, change it. So what I like to do is start with the head. Uh, I think that the head is probably a great place to start. Um, I do try to think of these drawings as compositions in and of themselves, where the viewer's eye is controlled and directed, um, just like you would have in a painting, um, just because I think it, why not? You know, you should be thinking as advanced as possible um, about the formal elements, even if it is just a, s a simple drawing. Uh, this is a wrapping line that I'm gonna give to the brow, just to indicate perspective. Um, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later. But wrapping lines or cross contours are um, shorthand, or a shorthand for perspective volumes. And you can kind of think of it like a rubber band wrapping around. And I always do try to draw all the way around and through on those. Um, head is first. Right? That's where I'm going to always start, because I think the viewer is going to start there. Um, so to me, it makes sense to begin the drawing in the same place. The next is the spine. So in our composition, head 
as the main area of psychological interest. Second is the spine. We said it's the most important thematic element of the body. So what we're really going to try to do is make the viewer aware of it. Uh, and the spine had three parts. Remember there was the cervical. And what I'm not drawing here is the contour. Right? I see that the neck has you know, this kind of incredible tilt to it. Um, what I'm trying to think about is inside. You know, What's the spine doing? So for this point, I'm, I'm going to go with this. I'm going to say that I think that the cervical section is kind of pushing back. Um, and then from there, we have the rib cage, really making a big tilt this way. Um, and you can see that I'm not really kind of tightening up and just choosing one or the other. Let your, you know, your shoulder have some freedom in how you are making the lines. And if you repeat them, that's fine also. Uh, it's not, um, it should not here be a contour. Right? You don't want to develop that to the width all the way. Um, it should just be the inside. You still want to have some ability to move into the development of the, the rest. And then into a thinking, uh, what I'll do with these lines is it'll either be like um, a stretch. Right? So that would be not exactly the spine, but a, a consequence of it in the front. And then the very last one being um, lumbar. So it just gives you a way to think about what these lines are trying to identify, even if they're not drawing the literal outside of the figure. And so it's kind of like the, again, the essence are extracting, withdrawing from this pose, what is the most essential to it. Um, so that's my three to four lines for the spine. One thing you could think about that may help is that each gesture line is kind of a curved, exaggerated representation of a part. Uh, in this sense, this is the cervical, this is the part of the thoracic, this is the part of the, the abdomen wall or the stretch, and this is the lumbar. Where my lines exhibit this transition is really at the joints. It's the place between the parts. So if you're having a hard time directing these lines or thinking about where they actually should be, um, try to use that. Use it as an interior line that's exaggerating the condition of each part, and then the overlaps or transitions uh, will be the joints. After the spine, most important to me is that I go to the weight-bearing leg. Uh, I really want to think about weight and how it's working or functioning the figure as quickly as possible. So that's what we're going to do is um, try to think and identify with that weight-bearing leg, which it so happens is this one. And we can see it's a little bit straighter. Uh, because of the emphasis here, we see a pinch and then a lean, and that's what we're going to really analyze next time. So here, I'm going to pick up for the weight-bearing leg. Uh, maybe it gets a little close to the outside, uh, but that's all right for now. And again, exaggeration. One of the things that I like about this pose is um, that kind of really dynamic push. So um, there's no value, as far as I see it, in just reproducing what's there by Michelangelo. So uh, why not exaggerate it if we have the capability to do so? Weight bearing leg, um, you can see this is a line that might represent the hip. This is an interior gesture that's showing the femur. And then I'm allowing at the joint that overlap and movement down and in to our tibia and fibula. And I've changed this axis to be even more diagonal. And, and then here's an idea for the foot. Okay, so that's story, weight, movement inherent in the lines, proportion. So how am I thinking about proportion early on? Um, very loosely. I'm thinking about the overall. I try to work from the head to the weight-bearing leg as quickly as possible so that I can estimate if this size looks correct. That to me is um, how I judge proportion. So many of the poses that you're likely to be drawing will be so dramatic or foreshortened um, that it doesn't matter or it, there's no real way to use a system of proportion. Um, you can kind of slowly work your way through landmarks, and we'll talk about that next. But for this opening statement, it's really important or more important that the drawing um, is more built off of the global. Um, and because of, there's, of there being so little investment early on at this stage, I can really change anything I need to. I can make the head bigger or larger. I can make the leg a little shorter. So it's, it's better to be kind of thinking about the parts and the relationships. Okay, um, that's proportion just because uh, we hadn't addressed it really at all. What I want to do now is introduce something a little bit different um, in weight and balance. What I like to think about with weight and balance is something called an about, or I'll call the about to pose. 
And this is the basic idea of giving yourself a way to think through the ideas um, related to story, uh, but also very much indebted to weight. And what I try to avoid in, in this pose, and maybe avoid is the wrong word, but be aware of, is stable poses. Um, so generally when we draw, there's a tendency to make everything really stable. And what this does, at least to me, is it makes the pose feel not only not interesting from a design standpoint, but the story level is really weakened um, for kind of a dynamic, exaggerated sense. Because there's no implication of any act to come or about to. And I think that's one of the best ways to really draw in the viewer, is to not tell them everything. In a sense, this kind of becomes a fact. It's a very powerful, stable pose. Uh, the shape and the design um, says all of those things, but there isn't an engagement beyond that. So I like to try to attribute the about to sense to uh, kind of an out of balance figure or chaotically posed figure because it makes you kind of think a little bit more about the pose, invest a little bit more because uh, you're not entirely sure if someone's upright or kind of falling or in the middle of an act. And I think it's a challenging, at the very least, a challenging uh, premise to build the drawings from. So I'll think about that. Um, one way you could think about it is kind of from the center of gravity that's around the belly button. And what I like to do is use that center of gravity to f flirt with or play off of. I don't always want to have the figure perfectly stable around that. And that's kind of what's happening here a little bit. So what we can do is play with possibilities from this point, really. Um, I can have a pose that's going to say um, very stable by doing and coming back to that idea of the triangle, which we really see in here. Um, anytime you have that very triangular nature or position to your pose, it does make it feel very stable. And now I have one type of story. And so he's leaned back, the weight's here, and then this really balances the pose. So what I would like to try to do is to flirt with that a bit, you know, to maybe say that there's a different possibility, at least uh, in the positioning. So here, uh, this leg really does need to be out to balance, especially because it's kind of up on a step. So I like to try to kind of play with moving it back a little more. Uh, in this position that's more forward, it becomes stable, not as stable as we just drew it in our kind of exaggeration, but I like to play with putting it just on the line or even slightly past. And each pose will be a little bit different, so it's not always going to have the same um, placement and exact positioning relative to where that weight is. Uh, but you can use this as a way to judge the type of story you're getting. So I would ask what happens if we put it back even more. And if I do also have like our block or step, does this suggest a movement? Does the figure look like uh, the balance is precarious enough to suggest a story, but at the same time it doesn't look like it's going to just fall over on its face? And I like that tension. I like that area of um, maybe we're involved in a movement, um, uh, or maybe it's you know in the process of taking action. That that to me seems a real fruitful area where the position at this stage can take on a lot of power and, and uh, involvement on the viewer's part. Um, a few things. What you can see that I've done is in some of the areas, I just kind of gather up like a process of you know, pulling these together um, with the implied perspectives. So perspective we're going to talk a little bit of, um, or a lot more about next, next time. But shorthanding again for these wrapping lines, right? these lines that are just repeating the elliptical statements specific to that cylinder. I'll just take these and it's a great way for me to get a sense of what the perspective is going to be. I know this is coming out, this is going back, uh, this is leaning back. So it's something that you can do to kind of give yourself the opportunity to think towards your perspective. And then um, if four was our supporting leg, at which point we talked about the about to position, um, the last step for me is the arms. And so here I'm going to use whatever I've developed as volumes, or I'm sorry, not volumes, as linear patterns 
So you kind of work into the arms. So this is raised in this study for the risen Christ, and then this is brought out. So my philosophy at this stage of the gesture is you can always make it less kind of exaggerated, but during the process of a drawing, you can never kind of amp it up. So it's better to start more or exaggerated, and then you can always turn down the volume, so to speak, if you need to later on. Uh, also, the process of our drawing will be essentially like that. It's going to be taking a lot of um, volumes and stacking them on top, and then anatomy and stacking them on top. So it's progressively going to get more and more stiff. So the more exaggeration early on is going to help remedy that. And that would be our first gesture. And so we've used asymmetrical lines. Um, you can see also, as far as our asymmetry, that the design extends to the lines themselves. I've done my best here to balance short, long, medium, uh, larger rhythms. Right? You can really explore and play with this. But I feel that this develops a very cohesive composition. Um, in this sense, my viewer starts at the head, which is our only shape, and then is pulled and coaxed into all these different lines so that they do experience the whole thing. Theoretically, wherever they enter, um, every line is related to the next, so, so they'll always have a, an entire intact experience. Okay, um, so that's the first one. Let's take a look at another. Here's a back view. It's a great reference for you guys to look at is characterdesigns.com. Uh, great, free, huge archive of imagery to study and do your gestures from. Um, so let's take a little bit longer with this one, or I'm sorry, shorter, as we did spend quite a bit of time on the last one. Um, and head, we are start, and spine. Cervical, thoracic. Okay, remember here, after the thoracic, one, two, here's my stretch line. Gives an idea of what the torso or the muscle in between the torso is doing. And then I'm into the lumbar. Pelvis. Next line is weight bearing leg, which is this one. Femur. See, remember all the areas that are in between are my transitions. And then just to be antagonistic and think about this about two, let's just see what happens if we push this back even more. And I always try to get the trajectory of my lines to follow a little bit more of a diagonal. Um, even if it's just slight like this, just because it inspires a little bit more feeling of movement. Supporting leg, um, where's my about to line? Let's say it center of gravity somewhere in here. So again, if I put the leg far out, that's going to mean that we have a very stable position. Uh, if we start to kind of sneak it back in, it's going to become less so. But the leg here is pretty straight. So that's the about to is really for you to think through invention skills. Uh, if we're just talking about doing gesture figures from an observation, um, then we can, there's no, also no problem with being a little bit more specific. So, um, supporting leg, nice long S curves, and that's something I will try to do with the supporting part of the body, is make the curves a little bit more simple or edited, uh, where in the parts of the body that are holding weight, sometimes you'll see my lines get a little bit more straight or insistent, um, almost getting closer to straights. Um, this is something that I just think suggests more of that quality, that I'm holding enough weight. The straight line seems to do a better job of that. The curve is more expressive for the um, stretched parts. Um, let's now play around with some wrapping lines. We would see underneath the pelvis from this part, uh, this leg kind of comes out, so let's offer up some cylinders or cylindrical shorthand in those wrapping lines. This is, let's say it's moving this way, away. Right. So that's pretty good. And then this is going to start to lean back. So there's our wrapping lines. And now to the arms. So here's, um, let's take and make a curve here for the shoulder. This picks up off of that stretch. Um, let that lead into a nice curve here for the humerus, and then we'll bring this back for the forearm. Just a quick indication now for the hand. Uh, this is pulling up. Here's an opportunity, you know, to maybe relate these two. If I can kind of pull that into the arm, it's a nice edited line. 
and then we'll build on this next week with volumes and such. Okay, so there's another gesture. Um, let's do one more, or a couple more actually. I want to make sure you get enough here. Front view, and for the front view, what we'll do now is um, similar to the last one, start with the head. And if I want, I can give um, a wrapping line for it as well, right here over the eye line. And then, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Cervical section of the spine uh, or our neck. You can see really what I'm trying to pick up on there is the tilt and then a dramatic counter positioning. Look, because of how much this has had to or has leaned, that the rib cage is really trying to correct for it. So we have this push, the wavering leg is here, and so we had the pelvis correcting again. And what you'll start to see, I hope, is um, how formulaic some of this can become because the repetition and the insistence on um, doing the same thing over and over again is so that, again, you'll notice constants in the figure, which um, I think is really going to help with your ability to invent and invent convincingly. There it is. Head, spine, lumbar, weight-bearing leg, supporting leg, Supporting leg still kind of feels the movement between the curves here and then over and across. So the knee indicating maybe um, an S curve or rhythmic pattern for the calf, and then we're down. Um, let's use some wrapping lines now. This is pushing up. Uh, this is. Oh, wait, let's see. This is coming out. And then this is pushed over. Pelvis. Pelvis always tips forward from the front. And then the rib cage is leaning back. Um, I'm also seeing that maybe I could even have exaggerated more. So let's say that, you know, I take the opportunity now to make a correction. There's certainly no rule against doing that. And it's really why the gesture stage exists, in my opinion, uh, if, apart from some of the more you know, philosophical reasons that we noted earlier, which I guess aren't really philosophical, but more about kind of rethinking what might be a, a realistic attitude towards drawing. Okay, and then we're in the arms. So I have this curve I can build lines from. Humerus comes out picks up, and then we have the arm covering up there. Later on we would play with you know, really trying to show this pinch in here, and then we have a nice arm uh, raised and then brought back in. And so that would be enough. It's loose, has a nice expressive quality to it, but at the very least it allows for us to build on top of it later. Okay, uh, let's do one last one. Um, just because we haven't really done much for the side view. Hopefully what you have noticed is that regardless of the angle that, that we've moved kind of around the figure from front to back, that it's always the spine. And I'm always thinking about the spine. So if you can just remember the spine um, in your head and spin it, those directional movements are um, the most important thing for finding and keeping the gestures consistent. So for this one, head, um, the spine. And so now I'm seeing like the profile, thoracic. Here's our stretch line, lumbar. Weight bearing leg is the one that's to the left. So I'm going to work into that. And here we don't even see the leg, but that's OK. Here's femur. And then foot. And then now on this one, I see some kind of opportunities to develop some pathways uh, with the stretched or so supporting leg. This nice long curve off the stretch of the figure might be a nice way to lead in and design a continuity between those forms. Uh, although this does kind of end me or leave me with a very stable position or pose. So it might be something I want to change. Uh, it just, 
it's great to have the flexibility to be able to change. So I could break that. I don't have to have this kind of long rhythmic line if it's something that I don't feel services what I need from this pose. We could change it. And then we could bring it in some and kind of break up that axis. Or if we were going to, let's say, be a little bit more insistent on a um, about to position, then I would maybe think about moving this in. Right? Because we're getting the leg a little bit closer to the center of gravity. We're decreasing that amount of space that shows that triangle in between the negative space of the feet. So, all ideas to think about. As the shoulder pushes back, I'm going to peel off the line that represented the thoracic, humerus, elbow, and then radius and the ulna here. And then just indication for the hand. Always want to indicate hand and feet. Oh, I'm sorry. You always want to indicate the hands in the feet. Um, you don't want the figures to just kind of be floating in space without a reference to a ground plane, and you also don't want them to be without hands, as it uh, seems to get avoided a lot because they're kind of difficult or awkward if not drawn right, but the more you do it, the better you'll get and the faster. So this comes out and then up as we have this kind of interesting place for the grab here. And then behind, so maybe just a little sphere here for the here. And that's it. I'd be happy with that as a gesture, um, especially because, uh, again, like I said, we're going to build on it. It gives me an idea of what it is I'll be building and presenting later on. So that is um, a few drawings. Hopefully that gives you a sense of the process between each one. Um, front, back, Profile, whoops, back, profile, whoops, and again, this uh, front version here. Um, I'll put these up on the blog just so you can have the JPEG of each one that we did and um, are capable of comparing them to each other. Uh, but this completes the process portion of the gesture. I hope you um, see how some of the ideas that I took a little bit longer to set up um, come to play here. Uh, and hopefully you see the, the relationship between the practical and uh, the explanation that went on. The next and last part of this lecture will be just a brief survey of some historical um, examples of how this is used so that you can get a sense for um, how prevalent it has been in the uh, presentation of uh, realistic figures. So okay, so this is the last part of our gesture lecture. It's the uh, portion that I'll try to do consistently for each, which is to throw in some examples of different types of um, artist work that incorporate the ideas that we talk about, be it uh, historical or contemporary um, stuff that, that you would see in entertainment design. Uh, these are from Da Vinci, just a page of sketches to show his gestural or thinking process. Um, most important or interesting to me are the very light graphite looking strokes. Uh, that do show quite a number of these types of active gestural thinking in relationship to figures. Um, there are some that see the sepia kind of ink a little bit more finalized for the figure stance, and perhaps that's his second stage or the development of a more of, um, well thought out or interesting pose. And another of the same. Um, so it's just another page where you could see kind of more so at the top that there's a uh, kind of collection of lighter lines uh, that show his working process. And then towards at the bottom, we'll see more of the uh, ink that are again working towards uh, giving a better idea, maybe working on top of the previous layer. So here we have an example of layering, perhaps, and um, the study of position, no matter how mundane. So a guy carrying a ladder, um, what looks like digging, pushing against a tree. Um, any different study of position, uh, activity, weight distribution, story, like we talked, uh, for building an archive, an archive of uh, gestures that you can kind of keep in your sketchbook, if nothing else, and use later on for uh, what might be your own personal invention work. So you can kind of think of it 
of this as um, a way of documenting and creating an archive of available positions and poses. Um, so this is another by Da Vinci as well. It's um, a study of uh, what looks like to be a, a gathered body of water or pool. And the importance uh, of this one in particular is um, first this. I think that we see quite a bit of this in Da Vinci's sketches and notebooks, more so than we may see actual drawings. And I think that's incredibly significant uh, because it lets us know that he's thinking and analyzing. He's not just passively copying any type of uh, visual subject. Um, and I think that we can even see that in his work. We don't see what would look like a you know, passive recording of the light and shadow effects over um, the surface of the water. Here what we see is a study of movement, and a study of movement very much like what it is we're doing. Uh, we have this area of water that seems to be entering what looks like a little whirlpool, and to communicate the idea of water, or more so than water, um, the active or activity of the subject, we see the same kind of recourse to line that we're using. Right, where we see all of these kind of lines uh, that really do have this overall guiding asymmetrical um, design behind them. So it's a visual uh, prompt for the viewer to experience motion through this organization of line, be it the figure, be it water, um, this type of fluidity uh, just su is suggested by the techniques we're covering. These are some early sketches from Michelangelo. Um, again, significant for the same reasons, as even though these might be a little bit more um, identified with the active and passive muscle groups specifically and not an inside working of gesture, it's the same principle. Right? If we were going to do uh, a study of this, uh, we're using the same lines, but we're just making them function more from the inside because we're studying uh, the buildup. Right, how one stage will suggest and lead to another. Uh, and I think after we have a better idea of that kind of whole buildup, then it's much more easy to kind of go where Michelangelo seems to be starting and working directly from the contour with the passive and active groups of muscles. And in fact, I think that would be the goal eventually, is to just um, know the steps so well that you can integrate them into your own type of working or thought process, as you will hear me say repeatedly. and um, suggest stages that could be left out right, or find ways to integrate stages. So similar, except what's happening here is he's just on the outside, but you could still see the agreement with the curvature that we've talked about. Uh, all the lines really do still have that asymmetrical movement and flow, um, especially here I think noticeable in the legs. So these rapid sketches that again are um, even though they do address the contour a little bit more specifically and quickly, they're showing the asymmetrical fluidity of the figure. And a few more, so you can kind of continue to see uh, how common maybe this approach was, or at least the agreement of uh, representation having this close proximity to asymmetry. Uh, a few more that I think just continue to show the, the same thing. It's especially evident here in the legs where we really see those lines kind of become a little bit more abstracted from the detailed positioning and drawing of the figure into um, more just lines, like especially in this one, where we really lose the sense of the contour. And that's kind of what I was talking about, that we have the, um, you know, I'm kind of grafting on to Michelangelo now, my ideas, but the line representing the part and then the absent area here representing the joint. Um, something here to the knee, and then a curve back into the leg. So am I suggesting that Michelangelo is drawing the way that I am uh, or I'm teaching? Probably not. I mean, there's really no way for me to know that. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is that there are similarities and that if we see enough similarities, um, it's a great way to kind of put yourself into dialogue or at least build um, or think of building common effects that these artists are known for. Here's another one, a sketch from his um, notebooks or sketchbooks. Uh, it's another study for a composition and the benefit here is that uh, it, this type of method or any method that allows for invention is great for organizing and inventing larger scenes where we're never going to get the kind of photo reference that we may need. 
Um, so I think there's an interesting example of a gesture figure there. Uh, it's really suggested. Um, but then something like this, I mean, you're never going to find models that will hold a pose like that. Uh, and then for some of the things or creatures or c characters that you may be uh, working to design, you're never going to find reference for ever. Um, so it's best to really do have some portion of your drawing process that can allow for that room for invention. Another by Michelangelo where we do see the finish of the drapery, obviously, but I'm always more interested in stuff like this, right? the, the lay-in. Uh, how can I get inside you know, the process more? And we do see here that really rhythmic suggestion of the curvature or the fluidity uh, of the upper torso. Um, another study for uh, a larger work, and here we see the work gone into um, refinement or refining the ideas uh, to be presented in larger pieces. Um, the examples of the different angles of the toes, uh, we see what may be a redesign of some of the shoulders. Uh, it's very possible, I don't know who could say, but perhaps this is the original observed model or figure that he may be using as reference, and uh, this may be a more idealized conception of that. Um, so the ability to not draw what we see or edit uh, with enough knowledge about the figure, that's entirely possible. To not have to be just um, indebted to what it is that we're seeing, but to be able to add uh, our own type of artistic intentions. Um, for the study of the creation, so we didn't have God and Adam posing for this piece, uh, or two guys suspended from the ceiling, so you get that nice effect of, of repose and anti-gravity on them as they're floating on clouds, but a lot of hard work. A lot of invention takes place in this, uh, where he's reorganizing the wrist, uh, the hand, the maybe the line of the rectus femoris gets three different positions. And of course, in Michelangelo, we see an example of indirect lighting. So not direct, like uh, he didn't wasn't able to go to Lowe's and buy a lamp and then light his figures. Uh, one of the suggested ways that I've understood Michelangelo's lighting is indirect, uh, where he's lighting most of the centers of the form. So we see a lot of uh, crest light on the centers, and then half tone taking place on the sides of the form, which is possibly one reason that his figures look a little bit more kind of rounded or muscular, uh, because of that accentuation of every detail or form. Uh, but I think if we really look at those centers of light, that they do in his work suggest the same or a similar type of asymmetrical movement through parts um, by counter positioning those centers slightly off axes to one another that re-encourages and helps to uh, make the rhythmic outside or contours really have a nice uh, continued effect. Uh, but other than that, we still just see in his choice of the contours how much asymmetrical design he's really given and allows to be shown for in the figure. Uh, Rembrandt, so another example of uh, great economy of line. And what I like about Rembrandt, uh, at least for his gestural sketches, is the way that he'll use um, line weight, kind of more as a composition or a compositional act. And that's not something that we've talked about so much. We talked about differences in line, be it uh, asymmetrical, repeating, or wrapping to build movement, uh, a different type of movement. Um, I think that if you're pure, pur purely excuse me, using asymmetrical lines, it would be a faster motion, like this. Uh, repeating lines would mimic any of these and would give you a much slower motion. And so you really do, in effect, with gesture, get fast and slow. Right, so this I'm kind of quickly going through. This I have to labor, or, or I get to kind of linger a little bit more and experience the lines. And then wrapping was to kind of tie it all together in order to get the perspective idea. Well, what Rembrandt seems to be doing is working from thin to thick. And I'll talk about this a little bit later with the anatomy, uh, but as far as the language for how I think and understand the bone or muscle, I'm almost always giving thick gradated lines to muscle to suggest um, a turn or a softness. Um, thick kind of, uh, or I'm sorry, thin sharper lines will mean bone. Uh, to show a difference or variation in the texture. And I think we do that pretty, w or he does it pretty well here, 
um, in St. Peter and John at the gate of the temple. A uh, lot lighter line weight here um, to kind of possibly suggest that more airy religious quality to the figure, whereas the um, crippled person or man towards the bottom um, is weighted. And look how dark and kind of thick a lot of the lines get around the face, around the knees, around the arm uh, that are kind of matched here to the quality of the way the cane's been drawn. So between these two, we get that contrast. We have the kind of thin, airy, um, different than how I discussed it with bone. It's purely here more for story. And then thick to suggest that weight. Uh, he's really uh, matching that line weight to the weighted quality psychologically or figuratively. Um, to our character here, whereas this gets the opposite, that thin, kind of light treatment. And they kind of have that nice diagonal relationship, right, where they have that dynamic interaction uh, that is suggesting really two different worlds and two parts of the, the sketch. Um, Hogarth, so what we're doing, and if you've seen the um, workshop, I did a similar run through on these images, um, is English. And what we've, or I'm doing is jumping around in history. Um, just picking out a few uh, of the artists that I really like that use line or asymmetry in an interesting way. Um, that's kind of also consistent with what we talk about uh, in the buildup. And we see his line of beauty. Right? That's one of his main aesthetic um, consistencies or approaches. And you see it everywhere. You see it on the, kind of on the side of the mirror. Uh, it's what he designed most of his figures with, and he wrote a treatise called um, The Analysis of Beauty in 1753, where he does talk quite at length uh, about his use or the effects of a serpentine line. So hopefully my spelling doesn't offend you. I'm, I'm not the, the greatest speller, but hopefully it's enough to get the point across. Um, and if you ever get a chance just to kind of quickly leaf through the book, it's really fascinating. Um, and you could see it, I should have included a large reproduction, but here, you know, there's um, a lot of variation and study of curve. Um, and then this is his compositional um, suggestion. It's also the cover of the book. Uh, and we have a, a type of unity with the represented here by the triangle. Uh, we, and these are the two kind of mainstays of composition. And then his variety, which is always that S. And the reason that I've juxtaposed these two is that I think that we see this structure inherent in the image. And what I'm suggesting by showing this is that uh, when we're studying the figure and building these curves, it is a way to just study the figure and I think develop your skill set pretty rapidly. But on the other hand, it can be uh, the impetuous for a compositional organization or a larger thinking of organization visually or your terms of visual organization. Uh, and that's why I like to take this time to kind of look at a few other people and see what what's doing. And here, we get the triangle uh, portrait, similar in nature to the uh, pyramid here. And then I think that we get through the side of the head and then maybe into the cleavage, that same type of design. And so we get that unity and variety, um, but also, again, very much indebted to the curvature and fluidity of the type of line we've talked about today. Uh, I've read this quality in Hogarth's work described as the pregnancy of the moment, um, which I think is just brilliant. Right? And it's discussed as an aesthetics of suspension, which isn't too different from how we discussed um, posing the figures in that about to sense. These are a couple of quotes from Hogarth. Um, the first being, his discussion of the line. Right? And he kind of, he brings you in with his discussion of uh, proceeding slowly and then uh, building into it. Um, and I've included that primarily for this, right? so that you can see a serpentine line described, um, how it is described. He talks about it giving play to the imagination, to lighting the eye, which is something that you need to consider as far as making imagery for a mass in an industry or an industry that appeals to the mass. Um, and then a suggestion there of variety and unity. Uh, the second one, he discusses the serpentine line a little bit more directly as it relates to the body. Um, and he talks about here how uh, the form and a continued waving of winding forms one into the other. 
here we have a suggestion of relationship between parts um, and how that can be seen by studying anatomical figures, etc. And so um, someone that just shows that uh, I'm doing my best to kind of replay or resuggest ideas that are very common to art history and the practice of representational art. Um, Thomas Hart Benton, to show an American artist, is someone that I think very clearly uses this asymmetry. Another populist, regionalist painter, he was interested in appeal to a mass audience. He worked for Disney for a very short time, um, studying or training the artists there. So he has a, a tangential connection to a type of animation industry. Um, and I think you can see it here. It's maybe more so motivated in his composition than any part of the figure directly. Uh, but still present nonetheless. And just another one by him. So popularizing or making popular the myth of Persephone in the context of kind of urban farm landscape. And then one of the last images is how we see it maybe more specifically in your industry. Um, and this is page 68 of The Illusion of Life where we see the discussion of appeal. Right, or what was um, the, I think, foundational moment for a Disney aesthetic. Uh, whereas something like this, in this very important kind of diagrammatic um, parallel, which might be Steamboat Willie, um, is reassessed by Disney to what was a much more successful, financially and aesthetically model, um, the asymmetry. So not anything much different than how we discussed it. And then a great description where he says, in nature we see forms and balance ready to move in any direction. Suggesting there that same type of suspension or about to that is so common to the way that we understand and relate to lifelike figures. So that's just a few images to kind of end our discussion of gesture with. Hopefully you've uh, felt comfortable with the transition from the beginning, which was our lecture or layout of my intentions and what I'd like you to think about into the second part, which was our um, practical, how-to, and into our last, which is just a very, very short and a brief um, snapshot of where it's been used and how. Um, so that's our last lecture or part of the first lecture. The next week we'll um, talk about building on top of this with shapes and architecture of the skeleton. Okay, thank you very much and I'll see you soon.